just allowing yourself to see all of the gifts and all the blessings that that you actually have and are enjoying. You know, as humans, it's easy for us to just kind of go to sleep on the stuff that we just take for granted every day. And, um, but if we kind of break that pattern, it's, it's, um, it's not too hard to find abundance. Hey, it's Rocky. Welcome to Richer Soul. Today's guest is David Tate, who will talk to us about conscious accountability. Imagine it's 12 months from now and you've achieved your major life goals. How does it feel to be in the best shape of your life? To wake up energized, excited about the day? To have great relationships and friends who support you and propel you forward? How does it feel to have an excess of money? To be able to make the choices you want? To be fearless and open to trying new adventures? Imagine being connected to the universe and it providing everything you desire. It's possible over time, and your past does not dictate your future. The only thing holding you back from this vision is you. It's time to take control of our thoughts and use them to our advantage. Welcome to Richer Soul, where we achieve our dreams and create harmony to health, wealth, relationships, time, and spirituality. If you have not had a chance to listen to episodes one through nine, I encourage you to go back and listen to the framework behind Richer Soul and how to create the life of your dreams. You can also find all the show notes for this episode at richersoul.com. Today's quote comes from Ida B. Wells. The way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. And that's what we're talking about today how to do this without blame, without shame, without getting emotional. But it all starts with that reflection in the mirror, which is always the case. Accountability starts with us being accountable for ourselves and doing what we will say we're going to do. A lot of people set goals on January 1. My question is, are you still working on them? I've got a theme for the first quarter. I continue to crank it out and focus on that. I know exactly what I want to do, what I'm looking to do. and We're making great strides towards improvement. So I'm pretty happy with it. My clients all set their targets for the year and we have accountability on both sides of the call. I do what I say I will. They do what they do and we track it over time. That's what accountability is all about. Get it done. It's really not that hard. Today, we have David C. Tate, a licensed clinical psychologist and an assistant clinical professor in psychiatry in the Yale School of Medicine, as well as a lecturer in the Yale School of Management. He's co-author of the new book, Conscious Accountability, Deepen Connections, Elevate Results. Always excited to bring you top talent experts. Today, we've got an Ivy League institution represented to help you be more accountable. Let's meet David Tate. Welcome to Richer Soul, David Tate. It's great to have you join us today. Thanks, Rocky. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And I'm excited to learn from you today. Let's start at the beginning. What was it like when you were growing up and how much did your family and school teach you about money? Oh, that's an interesting question. I probably didn't learn much about money in school. I have no recollection of any kind of money-related, financial-related education in school at all. Um, You know, I grew up the grandson of Italian immigrants who came to this country at the end of the 19th century, actually. My grandfather came from Italy when he was two. and he was one of five kids and his, his father was in search of a better life. And they settled in a small town in upstate New York um, called Mechanicville. Um, a lot of immigrants there. 
And um, my grandfather ended up, um, you know, going to law school um, and becoming the town lawyer. And he would, he would help these immigrants, you know, who were, you know, settling or having, having challenges of one kind of another. And he worked, you know, worked really hard and education was always um, kind of a, you know, he always saw it as the key to success in life. And, and that if you wanted to make money, if you wanted to be successful financially, that education was your pathway to, to get there. Um, and he, in fact, um, you know, helped put some money away for his, his kids and his, and, and even his grandkids, um, me being one of them to, um, you know, in support of our educations. Um, so that sort of was, was impressed upon me at an early age, like the importance of, you know, if you want to be successful, you really, you have to work hard and that, you know, pursuing your education is, is, is a good vehicle to, um, to open up opportunity. Um, and so, you know, I guess, you know, over time, um, you know, I think the conversations, you know, in my family were about, you know, how do you be a good steward of what you have? Um, how do you be thoughtful about, um, you know, you know, n- n- not, not spending more than you need to spend, not taking more than you need to take, but, um, you know, but, but, and, and also being, being a good, you know, wise steward of, of what it is that you have. So, Th- those were some of the some of the conversations I remember growing up. You know, it's kind of funny because you're a professor in a university, Yale. Yeah. And the conversations these days are, does education matter anymore in a sense? Like, is it mm. the pathway? And it's not to say that education's bad. It's just that the world has changed and access to information is so available. As a matter of fact, I take classes at Yale for free online, which is kind of (laughs) cool. Yeah, totally. They offer it. So has that paradigm shifted, especially since college has become so expensive? Yeah. I mean, I think today that the equivalent of that would be like, you know, there's, there's a distinction you can make between formal education and just being a lifelong learner. And, and, and I think that's being a lifelong learner is really more the important way, you know, way to go because you're right. There's so many ways we can, um, you know, get educated on so many things. I mean, <laughs> look at, <laughs> we have a whole generation of people who are getting educated through YouTube, right? Like I, I need to learn how to do something and I just go to YouTube and I, you know, figure it out. Um, but but there's something to be said for that, for being a self-starter, for someone who, who just seeks the information that they need and then can apply it where they need to apply it. And I also think people learn differently. Mm-hmm. And by having access to different kinds of education, you can learn in different ways. That's right. And you That's have to right. find what works for you. But I think the bigger thing is once you get educated, is take action and do something with it. Right. Which is Probably right. the other part of the question today, I think in the old days, if you got an education, a door was opened and you were welcomed in. Today, the door doesn't exactly open. Just Yeah, it's not necessarily the case. That's right. It's not necessarily the case. So it's really, you're right. It's as much about what you do with it and how you apply it as it is about getting the education in the first place. So out of curiosity, you're a psychologist, correct? Yes, that's right. How did you get involved in going into small businesses and dealing with conflicts? So, um, it's so, yeah, sort of an interesting story. So I, um, was on a, I got my, you know, I did my, uh, graduate work at the university of Virginia and then came to Yale to finish my, um, training as a pre-doctoral fellow and then a postdoctoral fellow. And I was on the research track for a couple of years and I, um, you know, research was that what I was doing was interesting, 
but it wasn't totally like filling my bucket. It wasn't like lighting me up. And I thought, you know what? You've worked way too hard to be doing something that you're kind of like, oh, this is, this is good, but not like super excited about. So I took some time off. And during that time, I did a lot of networking and talking to other psychologists and like, you know, learning about all the different ways that you could be a psychologist. And it's actually one of the things I love about this field. I think there's so many great applications of um, psychology to, you know, the, to human existence, you know, across so many different, different fields. So one gentleman that I, that I um, met uh, was working with family owned uh, businesses and family owned companies. And, and, you know, as I, you know, heard from him about the work, it was, it sounded number one, it sounded really interesting, but secondly, I could resonate with my own life. Um, so our family, um, everybody, most, a lot of my, um, my grandfathers were both lawyers. My father was a lawyer. My uncle was a lawyer. There was a family law firm. Um, and then later there was a family video store that, um, you know, my cousins owned and operated and I worked in, and there was also some family real estate, um, projects. So there was all this family business in my own background. And I never really connected the dots that, you know, wow, families who work together could sometimes need help um, kind of talking about or talking through um, some of the challenges that come up when you're, you know, family that are, that are working together. So um, it really made sense to me as I, as I thought about it, just even from my own lived experience. And so I started working, um, you know, with this um, this gentleman, and we worked together for a long time, and that was my um, introduction uh, to the to the you know to the to that field. Interesting. What is what are the biggest conflicts they tend to have? Well, there's a couple of you know a couple of of different kinds of conflicts that that come up. I mean, there are certain conflicts around, you know, when people are are working together in the business when two generations, for example, are working together or when siblings are working together. Um, sometimes it's, it's issues of competition. Sometimes it's power struggles. Um, um, a, a lot of times we'll see challenges when we are, when, when, when a business is in the process of succession planning, um, transitioning a business from generation to generation is, um, is, is, is a complex series of, you know, uh, of transactions and, and planning. And, um, and oftentimes, um, in those conversations, you know, there's a lot of emotions and, and there, and, and a lot of times when people get stuck, it's because they're fearful of what the impact of those emotions are going to be on the relationships. And they don't want to mess up family relationships. They don't want to hurt other people or, cause problems. Um, and so sometimes they kind of hold back or don't have those conversations or they try to have them and they kind of, things kind of blow up and people, you know, are, are you know, stop talking to each other and, and they realize, wait a second, we're having some, we're having some issues here. We need, we need to find another way. And it's hard to take a business from generation to generation. And these days, a lot of the kids have no again it's not their passion to be in a particular space just as if everyone said to you well you're going to take over the family law business that might not have been your thing that's right that's right and so oh. kids have a lot more freedom today to go out and do other things but then it's also how do you keep it going from one to the next and how do you teach the skills and of course how do you deal with the conflicts that that go all the way back to childhood that's right that's right. Uh, a lot, a lot of times they really do. You've all, you're out, you still see me as that, you know, 12 year old kid who was screwing up and now I'm, I'm actually, you know, a different person now, or, you know, mom always liked you best. You know, this is not fair. Um, you know, all, all of that stuff, some of it goes way back. You're right. Some of it goes back generations too, believe it or not. I do believe it. You know, I've been reading a lot about, not just on the psychology side, but on the genome side mm. and how what 
a family may have experienced three or four generations ago set off genomic changes that continue through. And even just family mindsets and behaviors Mm -hmm. that get passed down from generation to generation, if they're never examined or challenged, it becomes uh, a question. And you said, you know, you come from an Italian heritage, which is steep in, in that kind of generational passing of behaviors and mindsets. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, no question. Um, you know, I, I can absolutely see how that works in my own family and how we're, you know, you know, people, there's a, there's a, a, a story of my, of my great grandfather who was disciplining my grandfather who had done something wrong. And, and the way he did decided to do it was by um, throwing him into a river before he knew how to swim and had, he secretly had his friend nearby um, who was, who jumped in and saved him. But he, he basically, you know, convinced my grandfather he was about to drown him and, and um, you know, which is horrible. Um, and so my grandfather was a pretty harsh disciplinarian, not as bad as his own father. Right. But, but still pretty harsh. And so, you know, we could see how that played out for my father and, and, you know, my, my, his siblings and, 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 and all of that. So again, you know, these, these, these patterns get set up sometimes generations back and the subsequent generations are really oftentimes, you know, working through some of those challenges. You know, sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes good habits get laid down. And strengths get laid down. And those are the things that really help um, create positive, like, continuity and legacy, you know, over over time as well. So it can work both ways. And we see that with money all the time. But it, it also goes over to every other part. And I, I will say one of the things I've noticed when I was growing up is Italian families are very close. Mm. They used to be much more generational living and, you know... Grandma ruled the roost. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was a very female dominated, very, you know, there was the power and you did what you were told or <laughs> it was mm-hmm. hell to pay. Right. I don't know if that's still the case in today's or, or if that's kind of dissipated like many of the generational things. But I, I do remember that growing up and, and that's the way it used to be. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's true. So we're here to talk about your book. What inspired you to write the book, Conscious Accountability, Deepen Connections, Elevate Results? Yeah. So several years ago, I was asked to design a workshop on accountability. And when I was studying kind of existing models for, you know, how do you build systems of accountability inside organizations, what I saw made me feel that there was um, a lack of a deeper understanding of, of how people actually operate. It, it felt a little bit mechanical in terms of the way people thought about accountability. And it also seemed that some ideas of accountability um, leave people feeling kind of fearful and isolated and instead of feeling more connected and more empowered. So I began to think about how to create a different way of thinking about accountability that was a bit more humanistic um, in the way it like looked at accountability. And, and so building on that foundation, my colleagues and I developed this framework that we introduce in the, in the, in the, in our book, conscious accountability. And so, 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 you know, it, it started off as just this opportunity to create this material, but, as I, as I sort of did more research in this area, I really saw that accountability done right is like the secret sauce that makes everything work. <laughs> and if you have it, you have personal success, you have professional success. And if you don't, it's, you know, it's more challenging to, to, to find success and, and fulfillment. So that's sort of a broad, a broad overview. When you say that, does the accountability come from within or from outside? Yeah, right. I think ultimately, in the best of circumstances, it comes, starts, starts with you. Come, you know, it starts, starts inside. 
your own sense of being accountable to yourself and accountable to the people that you care about and that you're in relationship with, whether that's at home or at work. Do what you say you're going to do. What does conscious accountability mean? Okay, so part of what we argue in this book is that when we are more conscious, when we are more aware, we are in a better position to be accountable and to create accountability. So um, in fact, here's our definition of conscious accountability. Expanding awareness uh, to create deliberate intentions. Okay, so to be very deliberate about what it is that we want to create and, you know, what we intend. Um, and therefore, being able to take informed actions and to be responsible for our impact. So that's the, that's the way we think about um, conscious accountability. And when we think about consciousness, okay, we can think about that in a couple of ways. That, that we, can, we can look at that a little bit more deeply. Consciousness can, can be more awareness of ourselves, first of all. Like, what is it that we really want? What is it that we need? What is it that we value? Being aware, you know, being aware of our own, like, emotions and our own reactions, like, all of that helps us be clearer with other people about what we need, what we want, what we're willing to do. Um, you, it's also important to be conscious of others, and to try to be aware of what other people's experiences are, what their expectations are, what is it that they need, what is it that they value. So when we understand those things, we do a much better job of kind of working with people or, or working together with them to achieve a goal. And then, the, so, so the, and the third layer of accountability is kind of like awareness of the interdependencies that exist between you and other groups or other individuals, like, and with awareness that one's actions or inactions have some kind of impact, whether you meant it or not, on like a number of different people around you. So when we become more aware of those interdependencies, we can be much, um, much more accountable in terms of, um, you know, you know, being kind of tracking um, the impact of our actions or inactions on the, on the folks around us. And I think you talk about that in the book. You say managing our emotions seems to be a key, but yet you also say we sometimes don't even notice them. Mm, right. Well, that's the thing. When it comes to um, awareness, you know, like, you know, Sigmund Freud, you know, postulated that um, consciousness was like an iceberg and that there's a part of the iceberg that's above the water, but then there's a huge part that's underneath the water that, that we can't see. Um, and so, you know, the journey to consciousness, to greater consciousness is like, you never, you never get there. You never, you're never totally, con you're never totally conscious of everything. You can't be, but, um, but we can be on the journey and be, you know, make it a point as part of what we're doing to really be aware of the need to be conscious and to have practices that help us, um, you know, be as conscious as we can be. There was a quote in the book that I found absolutely hilarious and i know it to be true and it's essentially what parkinson's law is all about and it said if it weren't for the last minute nothing would get done right why don't people get stuff done why don't they get stuff done lots of reasons you know i do think that people don't get stuff done because they're unrealistic in terms of what they say yes to often saying yes to too, too much um, that, you know, I mean, I, I've seen this in my own life. I'm, I tend to be a people pleaser, you know, uh, you know, I, I want to make people happy. I, you know, I, I want to be agreeable. So sometimes I agree to things that, you know, you know, really I, I, I should have, I should have hit the pump, the brakes and really evaluated the whole landscape before saying yes. So that's, 
I think that's a common one. People reflexively say yes, instead of being more conscious and thinking about, wait a second, is this, is this something that I can, I can, you know, can really do according to what the expectations are. So that's a big one. And you said that in the book, you said, yes, people tend to overcommit. Are most people yes people or because I'm a big no person? No, and you're right. I mean, not everyone's a yes person. Some people are no people. And I have a lot of admiration for, for no people. Uh, as, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an aspiring no person. Um, but um, so, so th- I mean, so, but, so that's, that's, that's one way that people, you know, don't get stuff done. Another, another is, um, you know, like, uh, like managing pop-up priorities, right? When, when suddenly, you know, your, your work, you're, you're trying to focus on getting something done. And then suddenly there's an quote unquote emergency of some kind and, you know, and everything, you know, gets, um, kind of, uh, you know, um, sh- shuffled around and, and you, you, you don't end up completing the thing you were trying to do because uh, uh, of something else that happens. Um, so, you know, I think part of the success in, you know, in, in being able to deliver is having contingencies for, for these things as best as you can. But sometimes, you know, there's just stuff that happens and, and you, you know, you can't, you know, if some, if there's a true emergency and someone, you know, needs to go to the hospital or, you know, there's a, there's a medical thing or who knows what, like that, that these things happen, they can't always be avoided, but with sometimes with better planning, they can be. I'm a very big fan of margin because life happens right Right. now. Going to the hospital is a little bit extreme, Yep. but every day life happens. And do you create the margin to allow life to happen and so that you're not always on the edge? I think too many people run way too close to the edge and then one little hiccup and then everything blows up and then the next thing blows up and then now you're in a never ending cascade. But if you create margin, then it all works out. Right. Reminds me of like the doctor's, the doctor's office where, you know, if somebody gets, gets off base, you know, they're running 15 minutes late, then everybody else is, you know, just gets later and later all day to the poor last person, like doesn't get seen or whatever. I mean, that's, that's an example of not leaving margin. And I think you're right. Too often times we're often in situations where people are asked to do more with less, you know, more for less. And so people are squeezed. And so they're trying to figure out how to get more out of, you know, to fit more in. Um, And oftentimes that that's, you know, that's a mistake. Like that creates these situations where there is no margin and there is no room for, as you say, for life to happen as it does. Today's episode is sponsored by Profit Answer Man Podcast. Did you know that most small business owners hate looking at their financials? It's one reason they may struggle with business success. The Profit Answer Man Podcast helps them ensure they are profitable and can pay their employees and weather the storms we all have to face. It's built on the Profit First methodology of pay yourself first. The Profit Answer Man Podcast is a must listen to for every small business owner and anyone who wants to help them survive and thrive. Check it out on your favorite listening platform. So we tell people in those situations, when somebody puts something else on you, say, well, what would you like me to take off my plate? Right. Because everything can't be a priority. You pick the priority. We'll work on that priority. But what are we removing for today? Because it ain't all getting done. (laughs) That's right. That's right. So it's got to be a negotiation, right? It's not just a, okay, and here's more and here's more and here's more. We have to be, you know, responsible for what's on our plate. Not everybody knows what's on our plate, you know, unless we tell them, right? They have no idea, especially if you report to multiple people, they have no idea what's due. And I would hear that with my kids. Oh, the teacher gave us this homework and this. Well, 
None of the teachers are talking to each other. They don't know what's going on in other places. That's so right. you have to make it clear to them. You have to have the conversation and let them know and then say, how do you want to manage this? And it comes back to the same thing, though. The yes people just say yes, and then nothing gets done. And then everyone's upset. That's right. That's right. Because nobody took the time to question any of it. That's right. It's good to set expectations and it's better to set realistic expectations that everyone kind of signs on to that are not just realistic, that are shared. Right. So that's that's when when we, you know, in the book, we talk, we, we, we introduce these seven practices for creating, you know, conscious accountability. And the first practice is creating clarity around expectations and goals. What are we trying to get to? How are we going to do that together? And having that be something that, you know, is, is, is shared, mutually understood, and, and clear. So that's, that's the first challenge is getting to clarity. And, you know, human communication being what it is, it's often challenging just to get to that clarity, right? So it's learning to ask questions and ask for a recap. What did you hear me say? Mm-hmm. What are you going to do when? How are you handling this? You know, mm-hmm. have you actually mm-hmm. done this before? Mm-hmm. And just kind of making sure that the two of you are on the same page, because more often than not, people hear one thing and people say another, and then miscommunication just causes a lot of wasted work, which now <laughs> adds to the right to the pile. That's right. And it's because people didn't get clarity. So one of the things that you talk about in the book is the Johari window. Can you explain Mm. that and how it works? Yeah. So the Johari window was a tool that was developed by some psychologists several decades ago. And basically, it's a tool for understanding aspects of yourself. And it's basically a two by two window. So imagine a window pane with four kind of frames inside it. And the two dimensions are basically, is this something known to you? Yes or no? This is a part of yourself that is known to you. And then the other sort of axis, is this a part of yourself that is known to others? So when something is known to you and it's known to others, it's called the open section of the Johari window. And so, you know, when we are clear about what it is that we want, when we can kind of create expectations, when we share of ourselves, um, that, that section of the window gets, gets bigger. Um, and it's, it's often helpful to, um, you know, to, to have that part be as, as big as possible because that way other people kind of know where we're coming from um, and, and can, can respond to us in the best way. So then there's another part of the window that's, you know, you know it, but other people don't know it. So that's called the hidden window. So that's the stuff that you haven't necessarily shared or disclosed. And of course we all have, you know, not, we're not an open book in every single relationship where we, it's, it's appropriate to have things that are, that you keep to yourself. But a lot of times there are things about ourselves that would help people to know that we work with. Things like, you know, what are the situations or the conditions under which you really thrive? Or what are the things that really bother you? Um, The things that don't work for you. If we had more of those conversations, we could help create level expectations. But a lot of times we don't. We don't find all those things out about our coworkers and the people we, we work with. And so we can run into trouble when we don't know those things, or perhaps we would do better if we did. Anyway, that's the hidden window. Then there's the blind window. This is an interesting section. These are the things that other people see in you that you don't see in yourself. So the idea is we all have blind spots. And in particular, the thing that you can't know about yourself is the impact you're having on someone else. It's impossible to know that unless we get some kind of feedback, if we hear back from them about 
how you're being perceived or received by other people. So oftentimes that's out of our awareness. And so the only way, again, that we can get that is by asking other people for some kind of feedback or, um, you know, to, to, to help us see the things that we can't see. When I'm coaching folks, oftentimes we will look for people who work closely with them, with, with whom they have a trusted relationship, who, who can tell them, um, you know, hey, you know, you got some spinach on your teeth there. Um, and, you know, like to help them see that, you know, something that, you know, they, 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 that they might not be able to see um, and, and, and help them improve in that way. So finally, there's this last pane in the window, which is called the, um, the unknown pane of the window. It's, that's the stuff that you don't know. That's the stuff that other people also don't know. Um, and, you know, that, that's, that section, um, you know, it's, it may be the part in Freud's iceberg that's like uh, submerged, um, that's submerged down there that, that no one necessarily sees, but can be discovered. And oftentimes it can be discovered um, individually by, by someone, can, can learn more through introspection, Sometimes when we have some kind of a reaction that we don't understand, and if we scrutinize it, and, and we can learn something about ourselves. Um, and so it can also happen interpersonally as well, where there's some discovery that happens uh, uh, of something that we didn't really realize about ourselves. I call the one where you don't see it, but everyone else does the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room. And people don't want to talk about the elephant in the room. And it's just amazing how much pushback there is to just having those conversations. And even when you have them, the amount of pushback that occurs towards them. And it's kind of funny to watch all of well, that happen. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's often times where there are things that people um, are afraid to talk about or afraid to address. And yet everyone knows that we're not talking about it. <laughs> that comes down to what you talk about in the book is creating psychological safety. That's the right. The ability to have these conversations without it coming back to bite you later, mm -hmm. without it being that defensive type of situation. So that comes down to culture, I guess, right? Building that type of culture That's that right. allows that. That's right. And, you know, that's what we call, you know, the, the second practice in the book is called opening up engagement. And again, the idea is if you want a team that's engaged, that's willing to be accountable to one another, you have to sort of figure out how to get them more connected and more motivated. We think about opening up engagement in terms of how do we help people be and feel more committed to what they're doing? And then how do we open up psychological safety? And that's the point we're just talking about. And so there's a lot that leaders can do or people, whoever's in power or perceived to be in power, you know, I think it's really incumbent on them to kind of go first, to lay the groundwork and to sort of say, hey, you know what? We can talk about the mistakes you made. I make mistakes. You know, I screw up. Here's an example of how I screwed up and what I learned from it. So it's, it's okay. Or, you know, to like really... Let people know that if you're going to give them feedback, that that's welcome, that that's, you know, that you're not going to fly off the handle or you're not going to hold it against them. And of course, it has to be true <laughs> if it's going to work. If that's not true, then, then don't say it. But, um, but, but, you know, I think leaders can, can do a lot to, try, to like encourage people to be more, to, 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 to let their authentic voice show up and come into the conversation. That's what we really need. Um, you know, wh wh when we're able to do that, you know, you get, you get new ideas, you get the critiques that actually lead to the solution um, a lot of times. But if people are afraid to do that, then a lot of times that kind of growth is, is, is stifled. That makes a lot of sense. I think more often than not, and you talk about this in the book, people get more focused on the mistake versus focusing on the issue itself. And along those same lines, they focus on who's responsible, but not who can help solve it. And so you kind of create that loop of 
blame and struggle versus what do we do next? That's right. Yeah. One of the things we do in the book is we differentiate conscious accountability from what we call accountability 1.0. Like my grandfather's version of accountability. Hey, I'm going to throw, you know, my great grandfather, I'm going to throw you in the river. (laughs) You screw up. That's what happens. Conscious accountability has, instead of having a blame focus, has a learning orientation. It's always about what can we learn? And it's about, you know, not who screwed up, but who's empowered to make a difference and solve the problem as opposed to who created it. It's a more forward looking as opposed to backward looking approach to accountability. And it's all, it's also, um, Conscious accountability is always a shared endeavor. It's not just on one person to be accountable. Individual accountability is important, but when it comes to our collective goals and the things that we're trying to do together, it, it's, always, like, it's always shared responsibility in the end. So, um, and, and so, that, so those are some of the, the things that make conscious accountability a little different than the way people think about kind of traditional accountability, if you will. What percent of businesses use conscious accountability versus traditional accountability? And is it yeah. shifting? I would like to think it's shifting. I would like to think that people are recognizing the importance of creating in a learning environment. It's not, we're not just about the, bo- you know, we can't just be focused exclusively on the bottom line. We have to be thinking about um, each other. I mean, I mean, look, we've just gone through the, you know, the great resignation that, that certainly got a lot of um, attention these, these past couple of years. And, you know, I think part of the recognition is that the cultures that we create really matter um, in terms of, you know, if people are going to, um, you know, uh, work, people are, are, are much more attuned to well-being as, as a as an important aspect of their life. And if their job doesn't support that, well, they may be looking for, um, even if they have to, to, to make a little bit less, they may be willing to make a little bit less and work somewhere else in an environment that supports, you know, their life and their well-being more broadly. People are not driven by money. Like th- there are people who are driven by money. But mm. so here you run into two problems, Right. If they're driven by money and you grab them from somebody else by offering a little bit more money, someone's going to grab them from you (laughs) by offering a little bit more money. So it's a lose-lose game. Yep. You have to find people who are more driven to do what they love and, and to find the right place and then to create the space for them to be able to do that. Too often we go, oh, you're good at this. Go do this. And they don't want to. Or there's a part of the job they don't like doing and you're pushing people into that and then they end up leaving because it wasn't a good fit. And I think these days more and more, people want a good fit and meaningful work over just dollars. Yeah, absolutely. I I would I would agree with that. So back to your question, I mean, I think my my hope is that we are moving towards, you know, greater awareness of these things and that accountability, um, you know, can be used as a, you know, as a, as a positive force, um, you know, something that actually pulls people in and keeps them engaged and connected. And, um, as opposed to something that is like, you know, oh crap, I'm going to get in trouble. I better, you know, like, uh, you know, duck or, (laughs) you know, um, something that people try to avoid as opposed to embrace. So true. And it's funny because I remember there was another book I read a long time ago. I, I think we had him on as a guest. It was Count Honorable, which, which is the question, are you Count Honorable? Mm. And what are you doing from that accountability standpoint? So it comes back to kind of where we started, which is self-awareness and mm-hmm. doing what you say you're going to do. And if Mm -hmm. you can't do it, then being clear up front, which means sometimes we got to say no. And it's better to say, that's the thing I think people don't realize. It's better to say no and deliver well on what you can than to say yes and deliver crappy on everything you do. Right, right. You end up 
with, I mean, this is another reason why accountability is so important. It, it, we all have reputations. And what kind of a reputation we have has something to do with how accountable we are, right? When, we, when we're accountable, when we do what we say that we're going to do, we, we have integrity. And that becomes part of how we're known and how we're experienced by other people. And the reverse is true when, we, when, when our words and our actions don't match. Um, when, 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 you know, uh, so, you know, not, not to say that, ex- you know, sometimes there are fumbles, sometimes there, there are challenges, but like you like to be honest about those, to kind of come out and talk about them rather than trying to, uh, to, to, to bury them. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, it's, it's really our reputation that, that matters, you know, and, and, and our, and our own sense of personal integrity. I think for a while people forgot about that. <laughs> They're remembering again. Are there other areas of the book that we did not get a chance to cover that we should have? Okay, that's a good question. Well, the Connect framework is really kind of an experiential learning framework around accountability. So basically, you know, in addition to, um, you know, we talked about creating clarity. We talked about opening up engagement. We talked about nailing it, which is this idea of doing what you say you'll do. And then there's a couple, a couple of practices I think are worth mentioning here. This practice of noticing, which is when we are engaged in, in working with other people, paying attention to what you're experiencing, noticing what you're seeing with other people, and then like checking in along the way to um, share what you notice as an opportunity to clarify something that might need to be clarified, to course correct if there needs to be some kind of course correction. And so oftentimes we kind of set it and forget it, like we'll delegate and, you know, and assume it's going to work out just fine because we said it. But, you know, without that check-in, um, you know, some, you know, just the simple act of checking in does two things. Number one, it helps, it helps correct anything where you're, where you're misaligned, but it also shows care and, and, you know, it can show like that, you know, you actually care about the other people. Um, and, and, you know, they might need help. They might need, um, support. And so you can offer that and it builds the relationship as well. So, so that's the practice of, of noticing. And I think, again, it, it gets at, you know, noticing is, is part of how we become more aware. It's how we become more conscious. It's getting better at noticing on a number of different levels. And I think in the book, you had a great example of two people talking back and forth about getting their work done via text yep. and miscommunication because they weren't crystal clear on when they were available, when they were not, when they wanted something done, what the priority levels were. And when they, it was nice the way they went back and they apologized for not being clear in their expectations. Yep. And then saying, showing how, had they been clear in the expectations, things would have been done in a timely manner and done that both of them were on the same page. And I think, especially in today's world, and I, I don't, it drives me up the wall having 16 different communication methods. Oh, because yeah. I have no idea where the last one took place. And if it's not an email to me, it's very hard to create a chain. Right. And some of these companies have six different ways of communicating. And it's like, where was that? Who said what? When did they say this? Right. And thank God, like the iPhone now, I can actually mark messages on red. For the longest mm. time, you couldn't. So right. if they texted me and I looked at it and I was busy, it got forgot. That's right. Now I can at least unmark it and then it's fine. Right, right. But I think you, you raise a really good point with technology being what it is, with the fact that there are often so many multiple communication channels, it makes, you know, it elevates the risk of, of miscommunication happening sometimes because it's easy to, you know, for people to miss something in one place. Um, 
uh, you know, so, and, and I've certainly, I've experienced that myself, um, you know, where something gets, you know, sent out over email, but not everybody saw it. And some, some people saw the text. And so, you know, people are working off of different information and, and things kind of, you know, go sideways. So, um, but noticing can help. Um, and I was, I was saying a little earlier that, you know, part of, this whole framework is about learning. Um, and, and so that comes in the last three practices, which are exchanging feedback. And this is where we solicit, give, and receive feedback. Um, you know, again, the, we can't learn, we can't grow if we're not getting input from other people. Um, and, you know, oftentimes when I'm coaching people, the 360 exercise is one of the most powerful pieces, especially for leaders who don't necessarily get that feedback on a regular, perhaps because they've, they've gotten to a certain position of authority. And so, you know, people are more reluctant to give them direct feedback. And so they don't necessarily hear um, the, 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 the challenges or the places where they could improve. So that feedback can be very, um, very powerful exercise for folks. Um, to promote, you know, better awareness and learning. And then, you know, the, the next practice is claiming it, which is basically owning the results. And in order to own the results, you first have to actually know what the results are. So that means making sure you're measuring, um, the, you know, uh, results and, you know, taking responsibility for what's on your side of the street. Um, and, um, you know, figuring out what the implications are for, how you're going to be different later. And then that's, that gets us to the last practice of trying again, which is basically taking everything that we've learned um, through feedback, through the process of kind of claiming it and, and then applying that to the next situation. And that could be the next quarter. It could be the next meeting. Um, You know, if you learn something about what's working in your meetings and what's not working, trying again the next time. Um, so it's, it's this idea that we can continuously be improving our, our practice of accountability. Um, if we're paying attention and we're, you know, like taking stock in what we're learning along the way. Constant improvement. That's it. Never ends. Never ends. And I'm amazed at how few people actually focus on that and do that. Hmm. They make the same mistakes over and over. It's like, hello, we already <laughs> did this. Can we learn from it? No, right. I, I mean, I see that a lot in corporate. It's one of the reasons I'm in my own business, because then I don't have to deal with this. Right. Life right. is so much, so much easier. <laughs> I hear you. It's time to learn the secrets of life. What's your secret to living an abundant life? The secret to living an abundant life is really about perspective. And to me, if you are focused on gratitude for what it is that you have, it's not hard to find abundance. It's not hard to find it. It's there. And it's really just a matter of, you know, just allowing yourself to see all of the gifts and all the blessings that, that you actually have and are enjoying, you know, as humans, it's easy for us to just kind of go to sleep on the stuff that we just take for granted every day. And, um, but if we kind of break that pattern, it's, it's, um, it's not too hard to find abundance. We're living in the best of times. We live like better than kings not that long ago. I mean, if, you, right. if you go back to when your great grandfather came here, mm. I'm guessing they might not have had indoor plumbing, electricity, running water that was hot. Right. <laughs> and air right. conditioning. <laughs> None of those right. things. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, definitely a different world in not that long ago. Mm-hmm. What did you learn later in life that you wish you would have learned sooner? 
Mm. You know, this one of the things that I'm recently more aware of is the idea that, you know, it, it, I don't always have to be striving. I think on one hand, like it's natural to want to improve and strive and get better. And, but that can also lead to a, it's never enough. I'm never there. I have to keep going and keep going and go for the next thing, the next shiny thing, the next, you know, and I think changing the focus from doing to being is a, is a shift that I'm really interested in and, you know, working on, um, that it's really, it's not about getting anywhere. It's just about being, you know, the best and most authentic version of yourself. We are human beings, not human doings. Absolutely. And we forget that. We can all get trapped in the kind of the doing thing. And, um, and in fact, you know, at the end of our lives, it's really about the quality of our being. It's not all the things we accomplished. It's the moments that, you know, the relationships that we created. That takes presence. That takes being. So, so yeah, I think that's the thing that I've, I've been coming to later in my life. If you were to give an 18-year-old one specific piece of wisdom, what would it be? Hmm. If I were to give an 18 year old a specific piece of wisdom, I would say stay connected to the things that you're passionate about. Find out, continue to, you know, search for and, and explore and, and, and continue to focus on the things that, that light you up, that, that make you feel aligned with kind of you know, what feels good, what, what makes you feel like you're being a contribution and, and focus there, like allow yourself to, you know, I think sometimes I feel like this happened to me for a while. I got more focused on like the things that I thought I should be doing or that <laughs> what seemed like was the right thing to do as opposed to like, what is it that I want to do? Like, what's my heart calling me towards? And so so I, I would I would encourage that 18 year old to not to lose track of the things that that they're most excited about and most passionate about to sort of follow that as a North Star. And I agree with that. You still mm. got to figure out how to make money doing it. But there are ways to do that. That's you right. You just have to realize that uh, it is possible, especially in today's world. I think those opportunities are greater and greater. I, I agree. If people would like to learn more about you, your services, the book, what's the best place for them to go? The easiest and best place to go is online at www.consciousgrowthpartners.com. Um, we have a page on there about the book. We have a page, we have some, you know, we can get some information about, um, you know, the kind of work we do um, with leaders and teams and organizations. Um, so, so that would be the place to go, consciousgrowthpartners.com. And we'll put that in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us today. Rocky, thanks so much for this conversation. It flew by. What can you do differently when it comes to accountability? Will you take the time to look in the mirror and find your blind spots? Maybe a 360 survey to see what others see about you, both the good and the bad. How about removing the emotion when things don't go well and focusing on the solutions. How is your communication? Are you clear with what needs to be done and when and what it should look like? This goes for work, kids, even your spouse. Oh, I'll pick up the groceries. When? I need the milk for dinner. Did you stop? Yes? No? Maybe? These are the types of things. When you have clarity, things become easy. Check out the book if you want to learn more. And our next episode is actually Martin Signs. We're going to talk about mortgage note investing, something new to bring to you if you're not familiar with it. Do you know someone who needs accountability? How about sharing this episode with them? 
I think they'd appreciate it. I know I would. Thanks for doing that. Thanks for listening. Have an abundant week.